Hello, my name is Cordy Holt and this is Community Talk. Each of us has stories, stories that, that help us to understand and to explain our world. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people, people who have had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who have had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories that help us to better understand our world. And they help us to connect with each other. And Community Connections is about those people and about their stories. And I'm sure that you will enjoy meeting these amazing, amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Enjoy. And today, our guest is Rick Clough, a man who has informed, educated, and entertained us <laughs> as a broadcaster host on CBC Radio for 42 years. Welcome. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Gordy. Good to see you. It's a pleasure to have you here and uh, talk a little bit about... Uh, the time you, you've, you've got a connection with this community too. So sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You want to talk a little uh, bit about that? When we moved out here in 1997, um, well, I'll go back even further. When I was in Toronto as a sportscaster, I happened to know uh, Doug Stone, a mutual friend of ours who was then working for the uh, Etobicoke uh, Department of Recreation. And he said to me one day, Cluffer, I'm going to White Rock, British Columbia. And I said, where the heck is that? He had to show me on a map. <laughs> and uh, he came out, as you know, and worked, worked with you, worked for you, uh, and never lost my connection with him. So when the CBC offered us a position to come out here for originally three years to do the morning show, I had no idea where to live, but I phoned Stoney and he said, well, why don't you live down here? <laughs> and then he started talking about schools and catchment areas. And I had, you know, my two kids. So we ended up settling in Ocean Park. At 120, uh, 131 and 20th. And it was fabulous. Uh, we got to walk the White Rock Pier whenever we wanted. The kids rode their bikes through Crescent Park. It was just uh, an idyllic growing up experience for my kids. And for me, it was a long commute, but when you're doing it at three o'clock in the morning, there's very little traffic. You do meet a couple of RCMP officers with no sense of humor, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's the case, yeah. Yeah. But it was uh, easy for me to, to do the commute back and forth. And because uh, the benefits of living down there certainly outweighed the hassle of driving back and forth. And did Doug talk you into playing a lot of golf too? He did. He did, yeah. I've played a lot at Pete's Arch and uh, played a lot through, uh, through the last 20 some odd years with Stoney and all his gang. So. And he's still out practicing every day. And I know. And day. whenever I'm with him, I try to keep my hand in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good thinking. Now, can you talk a little bit about uh, your education and how you got into journalism in the first place? But oh gosh, my education. Um, I was one of those uh, kids in high school who didn't know what he wanted to do, and as a result, my high school marks were not terrific. I ended up going to Seneca College and took, believe it or not, going to college qualifying uh, because I didn't have, I hadn't graduated from high school, so I took college qualifying, and I. Went into Seneca College, and the first time I walked into a classroom where, A, the professor's hair was longer than mine, <laughs> had a beard, and believe it or not, you could actually smoke in the classrooms back then. Wow. I was, I think, 18 or 19. I was certainly the youngest person in the class, and I just fell in love with education and loved it. So I did three years at Seneca College, had a great time, graduated from Seneca in municipal administration. Then I went to the University of Western Ontario in London and did a combined uh, political science economics degree. Then I went to Carleton University and did a graduate degree in journalism. And then how did you get into, into the job in that? Then? Well, if you can believe it, it's so long ago, the CBC still did on-campus recruiting. Oh, did they? All right. And they came around to Carleton and I was interviewed by uh, three people. They offered me a job and we said, they said, uh, we'd like you to work in the National Radio Newsroom in Toronto. I said, terrific. But before we do that, since you're here, why don't you fill in on the Hill for the rest of the summer? Just because Parliament had risen and there was really nothing to do except dust the office. But I loved hanging out on the Hill. In fact, when I was a grad student, I used to go to question period every Wednesday afternoon sit in the gallery and just watch the performance, watch the theater balloon. <laughs> and theater it is. Oh, and still is, and yeah. loved it. 
and got to rub shoulders with um, people like John Diefenbaker. So then I went to Toronto, uh, was in the national newsroom for about a year. And then they came to me and said, we're down a sportscaster and we looked at your background and you've played football, you've coached football, would you be interested? And if you can believe it, I said, no, I, I don't think I want to be a sportscaster. I'm not going to stay here. I want to be a parliamentary reporter. Then they said, and your first assignment's going to be the World Junior Hockey Championships in Vienna, Austria. I said, oh, I might be your guy. <laughs> maybe. maybe there's and one. I said, I'll do it for two years. And two years became 21. Huh. And then in 1996, we had the Olympics in Atlanta. And there was the bombing at Centennial Square. And we didn't have, we had a small crew down there. We had about eight sportscasters and five or six producers, but no news people. So the newsroom in Toronto said, we need a live special. Can you guys go and can you just give us 10 minutes or as long as the material is strong. So I went into the studio and I remember saying to my producer at the time, who was Kevin Sylvester, I said, you just stay five minutes ahead of me. We'll be fine. We were on the air for two and a half hours. Wow. And our guys were out doing play by play of uh, a bomb sniffing dog going through Centennial Square. Another guy at the airport looking at police and how they're securing the airport because we had no idea who had done it, what was going on. Anyway, long story short, I came back to Toronto and they said, it's time for you to do a show. And would you consider moving to Vancouver? And as I said, they wanted me to come out for three years. I ended up staying for on that program 21 years. And it was great. So I had a fabulous career, which was almost Two exact halves, one in sports, and one in current affairs. Nicely divided. Yeah. And, and you did a lot of work in, in the community of South Surrey, White Rock, and you're out here in the, the jazz on the peninsula that you were involved in and did some work. In oh, Tucker. yeah. Yeah. With another mutual friend of ours, Robin Rankin, who was yeah. heading up the arts uh, community there and uh, approached me, and we, uh, we had a ball putting together the, the jazz performances at Earl Marriott at their theater there. And, it was uh, it was terrific. We had a great time. That was uh, Earl Marriott's little auditorium performance, wasn't it? That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. That was great. Yeah, it went very well. And you've done a lot of work with the Festival of Light more recently. Uh, more recently, yes. Uh, sadly, we're not going to have one this year, but I've been on the board of directors for the uh, Honda Celebration of Light for the last few years. And uh, that is a great experience. I love that as well. That's terrific. Yeah, that, that way of uh, bringing people together, and I guess uh, the pandemic really has taken away from that. So what, what are the things uh, about the involvement with the arts and the Festival of Light, and you combine that with uh, all of the things that you've uh, done with respect to sports and broadcasting, what, what are the things that uh, you've learned about a community and how that ties together and your contributions within that? Well, I was also involved a lot with my, both my kids, my son and my daughter were both heavily involved in semi amu sports. James played baseball and hockey and Mallory, of course, was a figure skater. Uh, and that really built community as well. Yeah. Uh, competitive sports. And, and, and when you're in house league sports like that, everybody can play and everybody is involved in the, the social development through sport for your kids. Um, and then I also, arts brings everybody together. The Festival of Lights obviously brings people together. And then the other thing I love to do, and I have done a lot of it, is um, serving meals at a soup kitchen on the downtown east side, which in an, is in a whole different dimension. Gordy uh, brings community together as well. Um, I just feel that you must be involved in your community. You must be involved in your neighborhood. Uh, if you live in a, in a silo, if you stay in your house and don't do anything, don't go anywhere, uh, you're the lesser for it. Exactly. What, what's your take on what's happening with uh, democracy in the states and the combination or impact of that and uh, and social media has on on our world these days? Uh, since I'm no longer on the CBC, I'm allowed to have an opinion. <laughs> uh, and I uh, I look south of the United States with what's going on there now politically, socially, culturally. And thank my lucky stars every day that I'm a Canadian and live on this side of the, the border. Uh, I don't think we appreciate what we have in this country until we look elsewhere. And uh, not just through the pandemic, but our politicians, our 
our society, the way Canadians support each other. Um, our problems here in this country are minor compared to some of the other problems around the world. As for social media, that um, luckily when I was at the CBC, we had people with the foresight to embrace social media in the early stages because they recognized the importance of it and the impact of it. And so I grew up sort of with Twitter and Facebook uh, in the professional situation, using it to get our message out. Now you look at it and you say to yourself, can you imagine, Gordy, if we were going through this without some sort of social media? The fact that you and I are on Zoom right now chatting, um, it's like we're having a, a visit in each other's family room, yet exactly, yeah. separated by distance, but it's, um, it's technology we have that connects us all now. And one of the the more challenging parts of that. I've had a number of conversations with uh, federal politicians who've talked about uh, there's always been these people on the fringe and social media uh, has now connected them. So they've developed into quantum and some people are expressing concerns about what that might mean for democracy where we're seeing these uh, outliers who've uh, always been in existence but now have support from each other both within communities, within countries and, and, outs and internationally. And that's the downside of, of social media. You're right. It gives, it gives uh, a voice to uh, the wacko friend. Yeah. Uh, and we all see it. And uh, hopefully we're all intelligent and mature enough to look at it, consider the source and dismiss it. Certainly uh, in the States, you've got a president that now likes to stoke the fires of the wacko fringe, as I, as I call them. And, and um, there are people, he's, he's given a voice to people who, well, frankly, don't deserve to have a voice. Yeah, yeah and ironically, I guess that uh, one of the great paradoxes of democracy is that uh, the best way to defend it is in many ways to, to argue about it, to be out there and, and do that. So and people can believe what they want to believe. So how do you manage what they want to believe and, and the reality of, of the impact that has on our, on our society and on our democratic process? And although we hear it all the time, um, they have the right to offer their opinion. Yeah. And you can't censor them. You can't deny them their free speech. You just have to be mature enough and I think sensible enough to consider what they're saying and make your own decision. And hopefully it's the right decision. And we, so we can believe what we want to believe, but you can't do what you want to do. And I think that, exactly. that line between belief and doing is the one that uh, we see threatened every now and then. Exactly. Crossing the border. And, Certainly, uh, as you point out, the example of uh, what's happening with, uh, with the United States and with Trump and the uh, almost permission he seems to be giving to so many people to push that boundary and push that fringe. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think, a, an ongoing challenge for us uh, societally. Absolutely. And, and living so close to the border, of course, it washes over onto us. And uh, I'm sure like, like you and I, many people have a lot of friends on the other side of the border. And uh, my heart breaks for them because a lot of them realize what's going on in their own country, and yet they feel powerless as the other side has become so strong and so vociferous in its criticism of, of everything they don't agree with. Yeah. And as you say, living so close to the border, we grew up playing basketball against Blaine Washington, sure. walking across the border be without ever being stopped, walking along the tracks. And it was a, we played in a fastball league down there. So we've got lots of good friends and relationships. and. And uh, those challenges now, uh, and the way they're seeing their, their country, and many of my friends are, have the same type of challenges we've been talking about before it's right. gone. Yeah, I have a lot of friends down there too who just shake their head and say, how do we ever get ourselves into this position? Yeah, yeah. So uh, reflecting on your, uh, your 42 years, and I know your, uh, your final show was, was pretty emotional. And uh, you had it was a tough. You want to talk a little bit about the, that final show and the issues and oh, I think um, it's like anything my dad said to me years ago you know if, if you find a job you love then you never work a day in your life and yeah. and I laughed every day from I was my hiring date was May the 4th 1976 and every day thereafter I laughed I had a great time work with some great people I had the opportunity to work alongside people like Peter oh, Peter Mansbridge who's still a pal and um, Vicki Gabbaro and Peter Zosky and I worked with some of the, the brightest and best minds in the country and I got to call them friend and still do yeah. many of them uh, and so my last broadcast was 
the culmination of those 42 years and nobody likes to say goodbye, but it was time. Um, I'd had open heart surgery and I'd been working as you mentioned for 42 years and you just knew when the time was right, but it was difficult to go. And it was a, it was a, a lovely show. The producers really put together a, a fabulous tribute and, the, and then to have Trudeau pop up and, and talk about what he used to listen to when he was living here yeah. in Vancouver. That was a thrill as well. So uh, yeah, it was a, it was an emotional show, but I've had no regrets and I don't miss the job anymore. I certainly don't miss the hours. I miss being involved in what's going on right now because this is the story of our lifetime. This is the story of the century and I would love to be in the midst of it, reporting on it and um, looking for stories that inspire and, and uplift people through some very trying times. Yeah, that's something you were always very good at in terms of the interviews that you carried out and the, the sensitivity you showed to those and, and challenging when that was appropriate. I think you were expert at doing that. Well, thank you very much. That's what I tried to do. Yeah, I think you did it extremely well. So in, in this uh, wonderful life that you've had doing that and that you continue to have making contributions to, to our province and to our country and uh, to our community in so many ways, what, what are the things that uh, you're most proud of in terms of that? things I'm most proud of, apart from my kids, of course. Um, personally, what I'm proud of is in my career, being a sportscaster and, and working as what we call the, in the toy department of broadcasting, where nobody takes you seriously. Yeah, I should point out that every sportscaster I worked with had at least one, if not two, university degrees. Uh, and when it was announced that I was coming out here, I got a mountain of mail saying, oh no, a sports guy doing my show. I don't want to listen anymore. This is going to be a failure. Please stay where you are. I don't mind you in sports. I can't listen to you doing current events. And I would write them and say, well, I'm a journalist. And for the last 21 years, my beat has been sports. And now my beat is going to be current affairs of Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. And what was gratifying was over the years I had so many letters from people I didn't want you to come out but now I can't do anything but turn you on in the morning and you become part of the family that's what I'm most proud of is, is the changing the mindset of a lot of listeners and, and um, yeah I guess when I think back that makes me particularly proud that I, I not it was me I was surrounded by a great people a great group of people and producers and and uh, associate producers and a technician by the name of Lee Rosevere who worked across the glass for me for 16 years. Uh, they were all part of making the early edition what it is and what it continues to be. So that's what I'm most proud of, I think. Uh, and this, the sense of accomplishment, uh, being part of a team and, and seeing that team develop and flourish and some of the young APs, associate producers that came in right out of school, how they blossomed into some of the greatest journalists we see now work in the CBC, foreign correspondents and both. Are there any important life lessons that you've learned over the course of uh, your time in broadcasting and other experiences that, that we can all learn from? Um, you know, my sister is a surgeon and she has said for many years, she said, we can never underestimate the power of attitude and laughter. And I've tried to laugh every day. And even when you feel down and out and you're feeling sorry for yourself, just remember there's always, there's somebody else on this planet who's worse off than you. So appreciate what you have, count your blessings and have fun. I've read somewhere, none of us are coming out of this thing alive, Gordy, so we may as well enjoy it the whole time we're here. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Actually, I was doing some work on medical assistance and dying and talking to some people and actually, I mean, they were asking the question, what is it ab ab about death and people trying to, to fight it? What's the cause? And one person said, well, the cause of death is actually birth, which I thought was a nice way of framing yeah. the, the context as it goes through that. Yeah. I think laughter is very, very important. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and loving and appreciating your friends and your family. Yeah. And sometimes we seem to take that for granted, both societally and politically. Oh. And, and look what we're doing now. I mean... Um, I've known you for 20 some odd years. I think the first week I arrived in, in, in Vancouver, I met you through Stoney. So that's right. Yeah. Uh, 
and I, I, I miss being able to shake your hand and pat you in the back and tease you. But <laughs> <laughs> you've had enough of that along the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so darn easy. Um, it is. And, and, but you just appreciate all the friends you have and how we contribute to each other's life. Yeah. yeah. So if there was one, one big change or one change in our society that, uh, that you thought you had power to do, what would that change be? Or what would you like to see in terms of us doing things or managing our world more sensitively and appropriately? Uh, I think care for our fellow human beings. Uh, as I said, I, I served meals for a number of years at First United Church in the downtown east side. And um, people who live in poverty, people who live in the downtown east side need our help. Yeah. And uh, every mayor I interviewed, including Gordon Campbell when he was the premier, but he was before that the mayor of Vancouver. I married, I've I've, I've interviewed every mayor up to and including Andrew, the current mayor. And uh, I say to them, how did you let this happen? How could we not extend a helping hand to these people who live on our streets, our sidewalks? And I, and I, I swear, Gordy, and you've heard this, every answer included the phrase, oh, Rick, but it's complicated. I don't think it's complicated. I think we've got to roll up our sleeves, have the political will, the compassion to help our fellow man. Uh, I've, I've served so many people meals down there who don't want to be there, who may be deal, dealing with one or two mental health issues, addiction issues, them both. Uh, if I had a magic wand, that's what I would do. And those who need our help, we extend a helping hand to them and offer them that help because so many of us, like you and I, we have been so fortunate in our lives, so blessed. And we've got to share some of that. And I think what we've seen over the last three months is money was always an issue. All of a sudden, money is not an issue. I don't know what the final bill is going to be for this COVID crisis. They're tossing around billions like they were $5 bills. And that's what it needs. It needs political will. It needs resources. And it needs somebody to lead leadership to roll up their sleeves and say, let's get this done. And let's change lives of people. Let's yeah. And I guess in that sense, the pandemic does give us an opportunity to not just revitalize the economy, but look what we're doing socially, educationally, environmentally. And uh, there are so many things that this gives an opportunity for us to address. And that's the benefit of going through this whole thing is, is the whole world has sort of taken a time out. Yeah. And it's given us an opportunity to restart and restructure and rethink how we have lived to this point. And I think there's gonna be massive changes. And I hope for the better. I hope we're smart enough as a, as a society, as a culture, to recognize where we went wrong and make those changes. Just yeah. look at how the environment has, we gave the environment, we gave the planet three months to take a deep breath. Yeah. And look what it's done. Yeah. It started to change our environment back to where it was. And I, th I just hope and pray that we, uh, we continue down that path and, and recognize that change has to be made. Yeah, and uh, certainly the, if you look back over history, the, the, the Great Depression and Roosevelt came in in 1932 and he, it wasn't just an economic revival, it was the New Deal. The New Deal, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Great Britain brought in Medicare after World War II and that's how Canada ended up getting our medical system. So right. some of these crises have actually turned into opportunities and I think we have to continue to focus on the opportunities that exist for us today to do the same. Absolutely so. Absolutely true. We've got an opportunity. Let's not squander it. Exactly so. Well, Rick, thank you very much for uh, your time and your energy and for all the contributions you've made to our country, to our province and our, our community. We're most grateful and uh, thank you so incredibly much for spending this, uh, this half hour talking about the things you've done and the contributions you've made and the relationships you've built. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful community.
Thanks again for joining. And until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.